Hey everybody, absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. Who's this sweet little creature that's lurking around? Oh, she'll be crawling around the whole time. Her name is Minu. I can't introduce you right now because she disappeared as soon as I clap. (laughs) But yeah, she's sweet. She's very skittish. I'm always so excited when somebody has a wandering critter in the background. Mine is, there she is. (gasps) Oh, It's hot, so she's asleep. So that picture you sent, Layton, of you and baby maybe was pretty awesome. That dog was small. Oh, yes. Yeah, she was way smaller than she is now. The picture that Brian's talking about is that I adopted her when she was 18 weeks old, and she was like this big. But when she was that tiny, she could sit on my shoulder like a parrot. And she's too big to do that now, but she still tries. (laughs) So if I'm in any sort of reclining position, she will (laughs) climb like here. It's great. That's she's so she's cute. the greatest. I love that. <laughs> I love it when dogs do that. They don't understand that they're getting bigger. Yeah, they have no sense of boundaries either. So oh, they're yeah. just like, oh, you were doing something on your laptop? What if I sat on it? Yeah. All my life, I grew up with collies, and they got these big, long noses. Oh, really? <laughs> and they would just, oh, wow. like, whack oh, them God. on door frames and stuff yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as they were reaching, like, adulthood. And it was just really, really sad. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they have the both ends because they have like long swishy tails too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Not as strong as a lot of dogs, but their big, awkward, funny noses were always getting in the way. Now, <laughs> at risk of actually asking a professional question, you grew up in a very interesting place, didn't you, Kellen? Or at least a geographically interesting place. Yeah, sure. I grew up in Yellowknife, which is a city that is basically as far north as you can get in North America, at least with a population like that. But it's like all the things you think about when you think of like the North, like the tree line, just like 30 days of night in the winter, 24 hour sunlight in the summer, Northern lights, no polar bears, (laughs) thankfully, (laughs) but they are in that area. But it's like a sizable city, right? Yellowknife was like 20,000 people, which for that far up North is like pretty big. I think that's bigger than Whitehorse, like, which is Yukon, which is the other place you think of, or probably the first place you think of when you think of like super high up north in Canada. Anyway, you guys probably think of Alaska, but it's all like, yes, (laughs) right next to each other in like a line. Yeah. I think of Barrow because of 30 days of night. Right. Yeah. That is real ish. Uh, (laughs) The 30 days of night, not the vampires. Right. No, of course. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But yeah, it's an interesting place. It's got a lot of character. I left because I wanted to go somewhere with more artists and stuff like that. At least more artists in my field. There's plenty of artists up there, but they're all like very traditional. They're not really into like cartoons and video games and stuff like that. Yeah. So I left to kind of escape the small town stuff, but I still kind of think like small towns make interesting people and a lot of the people up there have a lot of character. Yeah. It's like the perfect size. It has like a very family feel. Everybody knows each other. You go out and you want to like go and see some friends at the bar or whatever. You just go and you'll see like tons of people you know. And it's got like that kind of feel. But it's not like too small or too big, I guess. Right. A lot of people just get really comfy there. What brought your family up there? There's a lot of like mines up there. Like I think most people only live there because they have like a family member that moved there to work at the mines. Yeah. There was a gold mine. There's multiple diamond mines. Oh, wow. The one, the BHP, like a big, like De Beers diamond Mm -hmm. mine is up there. A famously cool corporation. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I see. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Asterisk, asterisk. (laughs) My dad worked for one of those mines and kind of worked his way up there. I wasn't born there. I was born in um, Newfoundland. Uh But I only lived there for maybe like six or seven years. And then... I moved to Yellowknife and like lived there basically my whole life. So I'm an honorary Yellowknifer. <laughs> I yeah, suppose. I think that counts. As much as I am an honorary Newfoundlander, depending on who I talk to, everyone's right. so elitist of <laughs> where I come from in Canada. <laughs> and now you're you're in Montreal, right? Yeah, 
I'm pretty happy here. <laughs> There's a lot of game development studios and animation yeah. studios. Mm -hmm. um, my girlfriend's here. She's working in video games and stuff like that. And so it's nice. I'm not doing studio work. I'm working uh, from home freelance, but it's just like the community is nice. Yeah. And it's a great city too. Yeah. Being in the physical proximity, it sounds like you found your group of cartoony gamer artist people. For sure. Yeah. I also moved here because of the music scene. The music scene's really cool. It's like notoriously good for Canada. Like yeah. all the big rock festivals happen here, like multiple every, well, they did happen every year, but right. yeah, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> it's been interesting moving here during the pandemic. There's all these reasons why I moved here, but you can't really take advantage of all of it right now. Every time I've been to Montreal, which is several times for science, giving talks at McGill, I love it. It's such a fun city. And yeah. it always felt to me, I know this isn't quite true because you can get deeper into Quebec and it really feels European, but it's like the most European you can get in North America. Yeah, kind of. And still speak English. Yeah, I mean, aside from the language, it's just like really old too. Like the buildings have a lot of character, like lots of old red brick buildings. I don't know. You don't really like see a lot of that in Canada. Totally. Um, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. like Toronto where it's just all like concrete and metal. <laughs> Yeah, I really like the whole St. Catharines area. Just the downtown is really nice. I could just like live there. Yeah. Of course, famously, Layton, do you know what the two competing Montreal bagel establishments are? Oh, well, you know me with my deep knowledge of all things Canadian and bagels. <laughs> so it turns out that like Montreal bagels are like a special thing. So Montreal bagels are like thinner and sweeter a mm -hmm. little bit. So I think the two are, there's saint Viateur and, fuck, is it Fairmont? I, I have this in my head as Fairmont. Now, I got to write this down because I didn't even know uh, <laughs> oh, the, yeah. the good bagel places. I know a few good poutine places. <laughs> I bet. The, the one I, God, what, why is, now I feel, I feel like a total bagel poser here. But you're drinking a little Tim Hortons. Oh, yeah. What's your stance on the Tim Hortons? The fabled land that I've only ever heard of. I think a lot of Canadians will say that it used to be pretty good, but it's not so much anymore because McDonald's actually has their coffee recipe now. Oh, really? Oh. Don't quote me on any of it. Oh, but, shit. It's uh, on. I think Burger King bought Tim Hortons a while back. And when they did, they like auctioned like all of their recipes off and then started from scratch. I think it's something <laughs> like that. And McDonald's has their coffee and that's why the McDonald's coffee is so banging now. <laughs> I had no idea. It was already pretty banging. Like the McCafe kind of knows what's up. Really? Uh, I, I'm shocked to hear this. Yeah. I, I have always written off everything McDonald's as complete bullshit. But no, no huh? McDonald's coffee is awesome. Oh, Brian. I love McDonald's what? coffee. It's really good. Yeah. Is, yeah. You, you got to be careful and not get like a macchiato or anything where it's like, okay, this is 90% well, milk. Well, no. It, that's like ordering a steak at a diner. What the fuck are you doing? You're like, oh. <laughs> but their, their coffee is good. And then you get that skeletonize your hand hot hash brown. Like it yep. hits. It's great. Yep. Give Mickey D's a chance. Wait, are you both McDonald's people? Am I learning this? I will have McDonald's coffee over almost at like second cup or, oh. or Starbucks any day. Yeah. Second cup, to be fair, completely sucks. Like, I really dislike second cup. I put it somewhere between McDonald's and Starbucks. Starbucks is definitely bottom for me, unless you're getting really? like a flavored drink. Yeah, I'll have their flavored Very drink yeah. in the other place, but it's like drip coffee of mm -hmm. McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> The gulf is so far between the quality of just like regular Starbucks, quote unquote, coffee, and then like flavored drinks, which I feel like you just can't even consider coffee, but they're so good. Yeah. <sighs> Second cup, it's like a coffee chain you see all over. How far west does it go? Is it all over Canada? Is it just a Canadian thing? Well, let me put it this way. I've never seen one in America. Oh, okay. It's everywhere. I saw them in Edmonton which is pretty far west. But um, I was just like, oh, it's just one of those places that's everywhere. See, this is <laughs> this is where it's, there's yeah. going to be things. I don't get out of Canada enough, so I don't know what, like, I'll probably <laughs> say a lot of things that are like, oh, you know, this place. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at pictures of, like, the storefront, and it looks like a fake coffee shop in a TV show. Like, the logo <laughs> treatment and everything. Yes, it like, totally Like, oh, an does. art department PA put this together. By the way, I was correct. Fairmont and Saint Viateur are the two bagel places, like two famous bagel places 
in Montreal. I wrote that so, down. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't it's, I didn't even know that. Not to get too far back into this, but like Montreal has a big Jewish population and like mm-hmm. Jewish Montreal culture is like a big thing. So there's famously Schwartz's, which does smoked meat. Love that place. Which you can get there, which place. rules. You get the smoked meat sandwich with the fries and the, you know, black cherry cola. It's, it's I, Every time uh, someone comes to visit, I take them there. That place is it great. Rules. For me, it's interesting because it's just, just different enough from like the Ashkenazi Jewish culture I grew up with in New Jersey, like the New Jersey, New York area. I mean, it's still recognizably the same thing, but that's not quite the same thing I would get uh, back home. Right. Yeah. But the food rules and it's a whole, it's a whole scene. It was recommended to me by one of my close metalhead friends. He's just like, you gotta, you gotta go there. But yeah. Yeah. Famously, metalheads love smoked meats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's not yeah. no relation there. I don't even know what the de- <laughs> well is. People with good taste, you know. Layton, it's exactly what I was about to say. The relationship is good taste. So, metalhead <laughs> and deli food. Am I remembering correctly? There's like a, a music scene up in Yellowknife too. I don't want to talk about Yellowknife the whole time, but it's oh, so no, interesting to me because it's like just a place I've never been. It was some kind of hardcore scene or something? Maybe Kind of, yeah. There's like a folk festival that happens there um, every summer. It's like the big mm-hmm. music festival. And they get some pretty big name people like every once in a while. They had like the White Stripes played there one year. And that was really That's awesome. Cool. They have like a bunch of guests. Like they got like the Trailer Park Boys guys to come up. Um, it's a big deal for <laughs> oh, Yellow shit. Knife. <laughs> Which are, I mean, they are the A-list stars of Canada, the Trailer Park Boys, of course, I right? I love them. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Trailer Park Boys is one of those things, everyone I know who's Canadian loves them. And every time I try to watch them, I'm like, I think I don't quite get it. Mm. You know, mm. I get the vibe. Right. Maybe I've also just done the thing where I've only watched the first season, which has not yet found its real voice or locked it in yet which is always a, a risk. But yeah, I like every time I've tried to give it a chance. Give it a little bit more of a chance. It's worth it. Yeah. I think the first like four seasons are really great. And then like they'd start jumping the shark really hard and getting really ridiculous. <laughs> uh-huh. um, but for me, it's not so much like the haha weed kind of thing. Yeah. The characters <laughs> are just like so, uh, <laughs> they're just like so f- well-written and defined. That there's a lot of stuff in the earlier seasons that I think you could like really study as like how to do like scenes. There's one scene that always stands out to me and it's really like not very interesting, literally, like what they're saying isn't interesting. The two of them are in a car and they're just talking to each other. And then, me knew. And then, um, (laughs) but it's like what they're doing while they're having this dialogue that I find really interesting. And it's like, it makes the scene so much more interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a dr- like a drink of alcohol on the dashboard while they're mm-hmm. driving and it's sliding around and they're both eating fun dip while while they're talking and <laughs> like the um, candy. The, yeah, the guy who's driving is like eating his fun dip with both hands and Ricky in the passenger seat is like holding the wheel and dipping into his fun dip and they're just talking and no, no attention is brought to any of this. It's just like a full exposition scene but like all the stuff happening is so like dense and distracting yeah. there's so much good like drink and prop work on that show especially julian like consistently running places with the glass i don't even know what episode or scene this is but he's like asleep and some shit's going down and then they wake him up and he stands up from the nap holding like a full glass of whiskey <laughs> Yeah. And it's just ready to go. Like, fuck. It's, it's little details. Also, my cat was screaming that entire time. And oh, now I can't see her. She's gone. <laughs> now she's an unofficial guest. I'm looking at how many Trailer Park Boys movies there are. And a shocking number. Yeah, yeah. The movies aren't so good. They're actually made by the same guys, but they feel like they're made by completely different people. Mm-hmm. or they're trying too hard, or something is weird about them. But I wouldn't watch those as a good example of the show. I would maybe watch like season two or three. Those are yeah. like pretty okay. funny. I will give it another chance. I respect both of your tastes. So if you're both telling me it's worth it, I will. I should yeah. do it again. At the very least, watch like a Mr. Leahy compilation on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> he's the greatest. Rest in peace. He is the highlight of the, yeah, rest that in peace. That actor. It's so interesting when these sketch groups 
decide to do movies. And of course, I'm thinking of Brain Candy, the Kids in the Hall movie. Mm -hmm. Famously, Run, Ronnie, Run, the Mr. Show movie. There was a Mr. Show movie? Oh my God, it (gasps) sucks. Yeah. It's like famously bad. Everybody affiliated with it hates it. So if you remember Mr. Show, I forget what season this is in. I think it might even be season one. They have Ronnie Dobbs. What was his original thing? He like suffers from some medical condition where he's always almost about to die. (laughs) And he's like (laughs) perpetually on the verge of death. And that's how he's introduced. And, you know, it's some rare fake medical condition. And then he's brought back as, I forget the name of the character. Bob Odenkirk has this like British documentarian character who's Mm -hmm. making some Ronnie Dobbs type musical thing. I can't even remember. And basically the deal is that Ronnie is a complete fuckwit idiot and has the most amazing singing voice you've ever heard. So like, okay, you know, he's trying to get these cops to sing on the musical and everything. It's basically a cops, the musical and Ronnie is drunk all the time on champagne. That's part of his deal. He keeps talking about having a champagne jam. Yeah. Then, you know, goes into the recording booth and just crushes it. And they decided to <laughs> essentially expand the story of Ronnie Dobbs into a feature. And it's bad. It doesn't work. Whitest Kids You Know did a movie as well. I think it's called like Sex Drive or something. And it's oh it's really? Good. I didn't know. I this. didn't realize they did a movie. It does have like a funny thing about it. And it's that they made like a um, director's cut, but they just green screened naked people in front of like (laughs) scenes. And so like they'll be having like a conversation where they'll be like sitting around a table and like some like naked guy will just like step into frame with his hands on his hips and then just like step out of frame. And like (laughs) they do it for the whole movie. And like that's that's the first version that I watched (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that might also have affected my opinion on the movie. That's so great. Brain Candy is actually pretty good. I'll watch Brain Candy a lot because it, it's got some good bits. But even even Run, Ronnie, Run has like one scene. And specifically, I'm thinking of Mandy Patinkin as Ronnie Dobbs in the fully staged Broadway musical, which is just fantastic. So he does this thing where he, he does the big emotional. Callan, you know what I'm talking about? Do you know the scene? No, no, it's sorry. (laughs) No, no, you nodded like it was familiar, but it is worth seeking out. Basically, Mandy Patinkin, he's wearing like denim overalls, which are one strapped down. And he's in this kind of rural setting on stage. Like it's in a big Mm -hmm. Broadway theater. And he does this like incredibly affecting Mandy Patinkin style ballad based on Ronnie Dobbs' big hit, Y'all Are Brutalizing Me. Uh, which is directed at the cops. <laughs> so they got Mandy Patinkin to do this, and it's really funny. And he just goes for it, and it's great. And then Bob Odenkirk, in character as the director, just stands up and basically goes, it's shit, you know, or something like that. What the fuck? You know, he just hates it. Yeah. And uh, it's a great scene. And it's literally the only good thing in the movie. That raises a good question of what are the best sketch comedy group making a movie And I have an answer for this question, but I'm curious what y'all think. I mean, the low-hanging fruit is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Right. Which Mm. is great. What about like a Netflix series, like a show? Like, would that count too? Sure. Yeah, what are you thinking? Auntie Donna, they're an Australian sketch comedy group. Oh yeah, I watched their show, it's funny. Yeah, they're great, and they put out a Netflix show, and it's just as good like just as good as their online stuff they were just allowed to just go crazy with it and there was no restrictions and it's great (laughs) i like their netflix show a lot i'd never seen the original the netflix show is great it's very funny Mm -hmm. sounds like you got more content to watch brian yeah (laughs) yeah their youtube channel's iconic what was your answer layden my answer was going to be hot rod uh, oh my god yeah i love that movie (laughs) very good answer (laughs) I was just watching clips from it last night. I was watching the high five scene in particular. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how it's done. And that's how you do that. I love that. 
<laughs> Every once in a while, uh, me and my friend go back and rewatch him slam dancing in the mountains, and then he like flies <laughs> off the edge and falls for ten minutes. Yes, we have to just watch that every once in a while. It's so good. I love that. That movie is like one of my all time favorites, and one of the few comedy movies that I will like actually still die laughing mm-hmm. every time. It's the scene after funny. there's like the the riot in the streets, mm-hmm. and yeah. Danny McBride is carrying a TV like. You know, it's just a relief that nobody got hurt. <laughs> yeah. So weird to see Danny McBride with such short hair, though. Like, I mean, right. you just never see him with that haircut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was watching the I Like to Party scene, which is a classic. <laughs> that was a contender for, like, my high school, like, senior quote. I like, I like to Party. Yeah. Pop Star is pretty great, too, if we're talking Lonely Island movies. Mm, I haven't seen that. Oh, it's one of those movies where you're like... This is far better than it needs to be to get the point across. They're so good at what they do, and they're all so funny. And the songs are great. It rules. There's a song in that. It's like a list song called Things in My Jeep, which is just a list of things in one of their Jeeps. That's awesome. I have to check that out. I'm going to write that down. It's good. If you like Hot Rod, you'll like it. For me, I like pop star never stop never stopping but it's hard to live up to the promise of hot rod which oh, yeah. will forever hold a place in my heart pop star is way more polished you know hot rod yeah. feels like a bunch of young people making a movie and pop star feels like yeah. a studio film not in a bad way yeah i think like to me the most miraculous thing about rewatching Hot Rod recently was I find myself going back to a lot of content from the 2000s and like being like, oh man, this has not aged very well at all. <laughs> right. Like right. just totally. like everything, like, you know, Adult Swim cartoons and stuff like that and movies, especially yeah. comedies. And that just is fine. It's just fine. There's nothing wrong with that one. And it's like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> You're exactly the way I remember. <laughs> Yeah, still funny. And the number of times Babe Wait is invoked oh. in my life of screaming, <laughs> scream. Wait, Babe, please. Yeah, no. I scream that at my girlfriend all the time. <laughs> all the time. That's that, the best. Yeah, for a while, because I saw that movie when it came out, and then I didn't watch it again for a little while, and then it became like really big in my friend group. But I was saying that for years and could babe not wait. remember where, where it came from. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, babe, no. <laughs> babe, wait. <laughs> I love that. Everybody, this is Late Night with Brian Wecht. Over here we have Leighton Craig. That was me. The one who just spoke was Brian Wecht. Hello. We are 112 episodes in, and we are so on it, on introducing the show on time, professionally, right. smoothly, cleanly, sexily, cool, coolly. Right, was this an acronym? <laughs> Is it so far? Could be. If I, I don't could, think if I could so. remember a word that I said. <laughs> but it might be. <laughs> um, but anyway, end of the acronym. The way you were doing this with your fingers is like, I was, wait, is she spelling something out? <laughs> like, but I guess not. I I'm thought, I thought you were on top of it. I thought you were just like, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. In real time. Okay. So mystery guest, who are you? What's up? Hi, I'm Kellen. I'm KLN or Ballbots online. I'm an animator and artist. And a lot of fans of Ninja Sex Party would probably know me as the person who did release the Kraken, the video. And uh, I've done some other stuff for um, like Marvel. I recently had a video come out like two weeks ago for Lyle Rath, which is really funny. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I'm kind of just known as the person what does the icons (laughs) and profile pictures for voice actors. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, so a couple things. You've also done a video for Go Banana Go, my kid's band. In fact, our, yeah, our lead that's single, right. Pizza mm-hmm. Feet. Uh, mm-hmm. And that and released the Kraken. Kraken? I don't know why I said it like that. Kraken, Audrey, watches all the time. She oh, loves no your release the Kraken so much. <laughs> and it's also one of the few NSP things I can show her at her age, which is, you know, there's not really any swearing in it it's actually somewhat family friendly so it's one of the few like original nsp songs i can show her and the fact that your video for it is so great it's probably the nsp video i watch more than literally anything else oh that makes me so happy 
it makes me so happy because I love it. And you did such an incredible <laughs> job with it. And it is, it's nice to have something like that. I can share with my daughter and be like, look, I make things for you too. In addition, of course, to the, <laughs> to the go banana go stuff. What else is in the tiny pool of like original NSP songs that she can hear? There's that one. Oh, well, everybody shut up. I have an erection, of course, is one of her favorites. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> what else can we play for her? Does Dinosaur Laser Fight No, have definitely not. Swears? Oh, it has uh, tons of swears. Like, it ends on a yeah. gigantic fuck. Oh. Welcome to my parents' house. We can play for her, but there's some F-bombs in there, which I get around by singing loudly over them. <laughs> Uh, whenever they happen. So there's a line. We've got mango and apple and guava and apple. So many fucking fruits. Or you can go so many kinds of fruits. And that, <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's a way around it. So there's that. She really likes. We have a sketch in one of our albums called Ninja Brian Goes to Soccer Practice, which she really, really likes. Yeah. What else? It's bedtime. We can play for mm-hmm. her. The, like songs that aren't about you know, just straight up fucking, uh, or <laughs> I'm not going to play thunder and lightning, which is about Danny's balls, you know, that mm-hmm. sort of stuff. That's not on the table, but you know, with suitable editing, there's actually a few Danny. Don't, you know, we have a clean version of, I can play for. Oh yeah. That and Kraken are literally it off of cool patrol. And then almost <laughs> nothing from the first three albums whatsoever. But anyway, my point is, we love release the Kraken in this house. And yeah. We listen to it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I put everything I had into that one at the time. As far as where my skills were at the time, I was just like, I just want to go all in on this. I was so happy to be doing a video for you guys. At the time, I would say doing like a ninja sex party video was like top stuff I wanted to do. So I was really happy when you guys reached out. That really meant a lot. Oh, of course. It taught me a lot as well about pacing myself and not letting my excitement for like a dream project get in the way of making (laughs) rational decisions (laughs) and that as an animator was like a lesson that i had to learn Uh on that project because i just like i think i sketched out every single scene with like an individual like background and stuff like that and like basically nothing got reused in the animatic i was like Mm -hmm. yeah that's good (laughs) and then when it came time to like actually doing it i was like Oh my God. (laughs) But yeah, you guys gave me plenty of time. How long did it take you from start to finish on that one? I mean, I think from when you gave it to me and when I handed it to you, it was like a year. That sounds about right. Yeah. Like I had Marvel reach out to me during that time. And so I asked Brian, Marvel wants me to do something for them. I've never done anything for them. It's going to take like a month. Can I like stop and work on that? And you're like, yeah, go ahead. So I think I worked on it for like eight months. And the rest of that was like, I did other projects at the same time. And of those eight months, I think six months were backgrounds. Yeah, the backgrounds are insane for that video. Thanks. The animation took like two months and was going along quite nicely. But I do the backgrounds first. And I've learned backgrounds take like longer than animation itself for me personally. Yeah. They can really get in the way of a project. For Pizza Feet, I basically did things for Pizza Feet the way I would now, where behind the scenes, I'm like, oh, I can reuse this here and I can just do like a pattern for this and stuff like that. Yeah, it was like a learning experience because I think when you reached out for me to do Release the Kraken, I had only been animating for like a year. What? No. Yeah, Yeah. I started animating in the summer of 2016 and you reached out in summer of 2017. I'm trying to remember. We must have seen like a a Grumps animated you did or something, right? Yeah, I did a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Game Grumps stuff was what got me into animating. I was like, I want to do this. I've always wanted to. And for me, just the way my brain works, the hardest thing about starting like a new medium of art or anything is like taking the first step. So I just put it off for years. Like I was like 30 when I started animating. Wow. And I think that it was just like a combination of... The Game Grumps community is so supportive. I've always wanted to animate. I feel like doing stuff like this could be my chance. And I'm 30 now. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to do it. So yeah, I did like my first animation ever. I don't even think I did like practice stuff. I just like animated a Game Grumps video as my practice. And that practice video got me like in contact with Aaron. And then I did the the baby one. Wow. Those Game Grumps animateds are just incredible because it's such a great community of people. 
I mean, we literally really do, as this is an example of, we watch them and we're like, whoa, this rules. Like, we got to talk to this person about doing an NSP thing or a Starbomb thing Mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, it's a great way to find up and coming artists Mm -hmm. and try to give them like a two or three minute video to work on and be like, hey, does this seem like something you can do? And yeah, it's been an invaluable resource for a lot of people. Yeah. As far as I can tell, like fairly unique, like at the time anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like now I feel like lots of communities have like cultures of animation and stuff like that and fan art. But like with Game Grumps, like guys had like thousands of artists and hundreds of animators. Like, yeah. Our goal with with all of these is to we can't afford to work with the people we used to work with because they've gotten so sure. famous and can charge such a high rate <laughs> that it's like, you know, OK, we, we can't use that person anymore because now they're charging studio rates. Mm-hmm. That's like the best possible outcome there. Yes. When I was in high school, my short stint with Flash, I made a couple of Game Grumps animated. So I was actually going through my like old pictures from high school looking for something. And I found like, I visited somebody who had like a home theater. And I remember I put one of my animations on the theater. So it's me like thumbs up next to it. It was, it was That's a real so learning great. experience. Oh. Yeah. Big shout out to Angie, who I think is the only person who's done late in night animated. Yes, and thus I love far. those. They're so great. Mm-hmm. They're really fun. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. I, I I need to like credit Angie properly because I don't want to just skate over that because they're really cool. And I love when you see somebody improving and like it, it's awesome. Like their latest one is really cool. Oh, for yeah. sure. I love how they j- just the how they draw us, I think is really Great a- animation, Aww. even yeah. stuff aside. I just the line art is is fantastic. I think it's really compelling. Yeah, it's uh, the YouTube. It's youtube.com slash user slash Disney fan three ninety two. Thank you, Angie. Yes, Go thank you, support Angie. them on Kofi. We love what you do. Mm-hmm. And they also do game grips animated. So yeah. If anybody else out there wants to do late night animated, we yeah. would <laughs> scream about it. <laughs> Aw, yeah. There's probably going to be people who know my art and animation and stuff like that watching this or people who tuned into my streams. So I figured I might as well bring it up and talk about it because I'm like, I'm pretty comfortable with what's going on and uh, and yeah. I don't mind discussing it. So, yeah, I recently just came out as trans. It's something I've wanted to do my whole life. I'm 35 now and it's something I definitely wish I had done like 10 years ago, but I kind of just spent my whole life maybe it's just a generational thing. Maybe it's just because of when I was born, just thinking that I couldn't do it, you know? Because it was it was too frightening, the prospect of, of doing it. Yeah, it's heavy, but also it was like a self-esteem thing. It's like I would look at myself in the mirror and just be like, it's not really about convincing other people. It's about like convincing myself that it's real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I remember a big part of my childhood was or like growing up you know like realizing santa claus isn't real it was like realizing i wouldn't get a wish in life and Mm -hmm. i remember as a little tiny kid i would be like i know what my wish would be like i know right away what my wish would be and then i remember it being like really devastating when i realized that that wasn't going to happen as a little kid still yeah yeah i must have been like maybe like six it was young it was definitely something that still like kept me up at night long after that I would have these like nightmares, not to bring it down. They're not like actually nightmares. I call them that because of how I would react to them. But they were mm-hmm. basically these dreams where I would have been born female and people would be supportive and nice. And I would be like around people at school and everyone would be totally fine with it. And then I'd wake up and it would like, you know, crash down. The dreams were really nice, but it's just the way that I would react afterwards that I call them nightmares. Yeah, I still get it now. I never grew out of it. I remember my mom when I was a little kid even caught up on it and she bought me a, what is it called? Like Lilith's Pet Shop sets, like a Barbie doll at one point. She Mm -hmm. just kind of knew. Yeah. I think parents, if they're paying any attention, like, you know what's up pretty early on. Mm -hmm. I'm still friends with a lot of my childhood friends. I have a bunch in my close friend group right now that I've known for like 25 plus years. It was something I always kept secret from everyone except maybe my partners. But for them, they were just like, that makes total sense. (laughs) When I finally came out about it like a year ago. My girlfriend knew about it, my current girlfriend. 
I only said current because my previous girlfriend, we like broke up over this. Oh, wow. Oh, that's rough. Uh, oh, this shit. has been a thing that's been like a point of contention with like some of the people I've dated in the past, mm-hmm. which also kind of kept me in this like perpetual state of, yeah, I, I shouldn't do this. But my girlfriend, she was just like so supportive always. Ever since I told her, like, we've been together for four years and I told her like basically right up front. And she was just like so like, yes, yes. Like, if you want to do it, you should do it and I'll be there for you. I love and, that. Um, so great. Like a year ago, I was just like, I'm, I, I'm turning 35 this year. I'm not going to get any of that time back. I think I should just do it. I think I should really do it. And I especially I was watching a lot of YouTube channels or just following a lot of trans people and their transformations. And like some of their transformations are just like gorgeous and beautiful and amazing. And they seem so happy. And I'm like, another thing that I feel is generational is how trans people are portrayed in media. And it's Mm -hmm. often portrayed as like this gross, evil thing. Like, I don't know, Ace Ventura comes to mind when like... I mean, a famously disgusting example. Yeah, They excruciatingly have a bunch of characters throw up for like a minute straight. And it's it's like... terrible, yeah. Cool, man, thanks. But like, I'm sure that on some subconscious level that contributed to my feeling of I can't do this. Mm -hmm. For sure, of course. And there's also like the horror genre element of that too, especially like with Silence of the Lambs. Like I know a lot of trans people who... You know, when like that's the only representation that you see. Sleepaway camp, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, some of these have like reputations of being like some of the best horror movies ever made. Super widespread. Everyone's seen them. And it's like, yeah, cool. (laughs) And that's a complicated Yeah, that's an immeasurable negative impact. (laughs) Totally. There's definitely the fictional side to it. But every like real life trans person I've ever met has been like beautiful and like a wonderful person and yeah it really inspired me to just like go for it and I can definitely say that I'm happier that's so great it's definitely improved my uh mental health doing this there's like fears I have obviously like for sure you know some people react negatively in public going out in public was a very difficult thing well yeah I was gonna ask you came out at such an wild time with the pandemic and everything going on. So you came out while being trapped inside to some extent, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. So the thing I was going to ask was, had you been going out like into the world at all before you came out or was it like it's two years or whatever? And then your next experience going outside is as a, as a trans woman. Yeah. I mean, I, I had done it before I came out, especially before I came out online Basically a year ago, when I say that I started going on this journey, that was me like testing things. Um, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. All I knew was that if I was going to go for it, like I needed to start somewhere. So, you know, I set like goals for myself. And the first one was just to experiment and like dressing up and stuff like that and going out. And Mm. at first I only felt comfortable doing it with someone else. And so I would go out with my girlfriend or I'd go out with my friend Topspin. Oh, sure. Topspin the Fuzzy. He's an animator. He lives here. We're very close. And so me and Topspin and Lady Red would just go out and go to the mall and stuff like that and go shopping. And I think it was like when we went shopping that I was like, this feels really nice. (laughs) Like (laughs) it felt really great. And I was just like, yeah, I like this. But doing it during the pandemic has kind of been like a bit of a weird blessing. It's like... I've had lots of time to reflect on my own. I live with no roommates now for the first time, like in my whole life. And Mm -hmm. I feel like I've grown a bunch from that. And being like in this situation where I don't have any eyes on me and just being like, yeah, I do want to go for this thing that I've just like always felt kind of embarrassed about. You know what? Fuck it. I'm going to do it. Yeah, (laughs) That's been great. Even just like being able to wear a mask in public has been kind of nice. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm already like a fairly introverted person. So just being able to like wear a mask while I'm dressed up has been, yeah. That's so great. Yeah. I feel like a good gradual weaning onto it, I guess. The idea of having like tiers of stuff to try is really smart. Oh, yeah. Thanks. I wanted to set short-term and long-term goals and reach out. And now like looking back, 
a year later. I like thought some of those would take years to reach. Like oh, they wow. just seemed like so out there. And I've hit like every single one of them. Laser hair removal was like a big thing. So like I had it done on my face. That to me was like the biggest point of like dysphoria was like looking at like any stubble I had on my face was like that just sent me off. Like I hated it and I've always hated it. And then getting HRT, I've been on that for like five months now. And that's really nice. To me, that's like where like it feels like magic. It just feels like actual real life magic. Yeah. That was very moving when I started noticing changes and stuff like that. That was like, oh my God, stuff I could only dream about. It's so cool watching friends go on HRT or T and like... I'm not on Twitter anymore, but I've followed a lot of like people's transitions via like private Twitter accounts and stuff. And there's just like so much joy. It's amazing how quickly like you start seeing changes too, right? It's not oh, yeah. like two years later, this is going to take effect. You know, it's like kind of almost right away, right? Yeah, basically. And then other goals. I mean, I have goals that I haven't met, but the biggest one for me is vocal training. I want to do vocal mm-hmm. training, but I haven't like started doing it yet so you know obviously i'm not like projecting anything in my voice it's all still so new too that i don't really like blame people who i haven't told directly if they're like they call me dude or they call me man or bro or whatever i'm just like yeah it's fine i don't whatever (laughs) well and also (laughs) if people do misgender you if they're friends they'd appreciate being corrected too where it's like hey actually oh yeah my friends have been wonderful no one should be upset about being corrected about that. Like, Oh, no, no, for sure. Because I know that some people get like mad or defensive when they're told that they've done something like misgendered. I mean, it, it makes sense. It's, it's a human response to be defensive, but also it's like... Come but it's on. like no one really expected you to know. That's why we're telling you. In general, I think about defensiveness a lot, and it is something that I actively try to erase from my personality. Everyone's defensive about different things. Yeah. Actually, the highest compliment I ever got from my therapist was she told me (laughs) that I was the least defensive person she'd met. And I was like, fuck yeah, I am. That's right. That sounds awesome. I'm about to forward your therapist every What's Poppin' segment we've ever done. (laughs) Okay. In the run of this show. To to, to be fair, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah, to be fair. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yes. Anyway, All so right. my, my point is defense. I get defensiveness, but with something like this, I'm also like, come on. If you get someone's name wrong, if you get someone's pronouns wrong, whatever, be corrected. And why, why would you not want to be it's corrected about, about that? You. It's not about <laughs> like, you. Shut up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like it when people respond that way. And I've had a few people respond that way. Generally, there are other people in my generation that get like, well, how was I supposed to know? It's like, no, 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 calm down. You weren't supposed to know. (laughs) Well, and I'm sure you're not coming at them with like a weird energy either. We're like, you know each other. You're a pretty chill person. I'm sure you're not like jumping down their throats. Oh, no, not at all. Basically, what I was getting at is that I understand, especially when I just have a relationship with people like other artists over Discord or something like that. I've had some people just be like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize until I checked your Twitter or whatever. And I'm just like, it's cool. It's whatever. It's fine. No worries. I didn't expect it, especially since I'm not projecting it in my voice, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, I feel bad if I get someone's name or pronouns or any any personal information wrong. And look, I have, of course, straight up called people by the wrong name to their faces a million times. Like, (laughs) and then I'm like, oh, I still remember it. And I'm mortified even about like that sort of stuff. So I think it's like that fear of like feeling goofed on or feeling that gut reaction fear of, of almost feeling humiliated, even when there was none intended or yes none happening it's just people get yeah. like people are people very good at taking things personally that have nothing to do with them yeah i'm making it sound like i've had a lot of that i haven't <laughs> it's been like really nice actually the reason that it took me so long after i decided to go forward with this to come out online is because i wanted to talk to my family first i wanted to talk to my like my mom and my dad and my grandma and it was a bit tough. Yeah, I bet. I had no fear that they would be fine with it. They've always been very supportive and nice. It's just very obviously heavy. Sure. And my dad, I probably would have done it a lot sooner, but my dad wanted to go on this big fishing trip with me. And I was like, my dad wants to have a little father son like fishing trip thing. <laughs> uh-huh. I'll save it. Until, I'll save it until after that. It almost became <laughs> like symbolic to me. And I told him later 
what it meant to me that he did that. Because yeah. we never really did a lot of stuff like that when we were younger. And I was like, it feels like a send-off. I told him afterwards because I didn't want him to be like flustered or anything like that while we were on mm-hmm. the trip. But it was really nice that we did that. And so I waited until after that before I came out to them. And yeah. they were so, so nice. I had no problems with my family. That's so great. Even grandma. My grandma is great too. Yeah. That's so great. My grandma is just like, I guess I'm going to have to start calling Kellen my granddaughter. And I was just like... <laughs> That's <laughs> Oh my god. It's so awesome when people just like get it. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed the thing about Newfies. They're all like fiercely supportive of their families. It was like a big group hug from all of them when I came out. It was very nice. No uh negativity. Very little online too. Yeah. Fuck yeah. For all the doom scrolling and Twitter craziness and stuff like that, like I had basically only positivity on there. That's so great. For the thing I was going to say before, when you talked about seeing people transition publicly, you know, on social media and having that be such a positive influence, it's nice to point to this very specific thing and be like, look, social media actually can bring joy into the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not a net positive probably, but we can at least point to (laughs) examples where it's like, look, this did a good thing for someone. Right. Like, yeah. it, it's nice to have those examples be so concrete. Yeah. It's been very nice to have a wall. I have like a Sona that I'm working on right now for like VTubing. Mm-hmm. And um, I feel like oh that's God. very, very helpful, very useful in the transition. And I know a, a bunch of other trans people have also used VTubing as like a way of, I don't want to say it's like a mask because I'm not like hiding anything. But it is nice to have a filter like that, I guess. Yeah, I think there's something to like how tightly knit like queer artist communities are in real life, but also online, especially when it comes around like video games or VTubers or having this element of like, I am embodying this other thing that maybe feels more safe. Yeah. Then, you know, it's like you're trying new things out. And I think that is cool. Yeah. Yeah. So... That's what's been going on lately. <laughs> <laughs> and your eyeliner is perfect. I love Thank the you. Yeah, I mean, you Thank do you, you so do much. look incredible. To be fair, like uh, it, yeah. it's Thank so great you. to to see it, your face. It takes yeah most people years to do the the little liner trick. So <laughs> you got it down. Steady artist hands, I suppose. You're right. <laughs> but, yeah, it yeah. did take some practice for sure. Did you have to watch like makeup tutorials and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, and I have a lot of close friends in my circle that do like makeup, like lots of makeup. Uh, One of my friends, Kashmir Thought on Twitter, does like crazy goth makeup. It's so wild. It's so beautiful. And they helped me a ton. That's awesome. I've had like a very supportive little circle that have helped me um, find my place. Yeah, I, I loved seeing the support online too. You know, as you said, like the Grumps community of Grumps animators and artists and everything is generally pretty supportive. And it was just lovely to see when you came out online to see everybody show up for it. and Lots of familiar faces. Cool. Yeah, it was really yeah. nice. It was really great. Thank you for talking about this on this show because we have such like a significant listener base that are non-binary or trans. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think this will be, I'm sorry, I've been, I've been like sitting here tearing up and I imagine oh. that might be the case for other people <laughs> listening, but I'm so happy for you. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for letting me talk about it. I mean, I feel like I have a lot to say about it that I don't get to like let out very much right now. I stopped streaming while I try to sort this out. So I've had a lot of bottled up stuff to talk about. If anybody finds any of this helpful or or anything like that, I'm very happy for you. I hope it does. I think it will. I really think people will listen to this and be helped by it and feel better about themselves because of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to read whatever the comments or discussion on this. Cool. Yeah, me too. I was going to say, while we're in this mode of positivity, I do think we should introduce segments. (laughs) <laughs> which sure. are, are usually... Okay. hold on. Wait, no, what? Yes, like, <laughs> yes, what? I had a question that's unrelated to segments that oh, I wanted okay. to ask because yes, I looked at your deviant art and I wanted to ask you about your saw piece because oh, yeah, okay. I love that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and you mentioned in the, the description of being your favorite soap opera. <laughs> it's like, you are so correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy that you like that one. I like Saw. A lot of people put it off. They're just like, I don't like gore and stuff like that, which is fair. That's why I haven't watched it. I'm not a gore person. 
And yeah. I have been scared of watching it because I figured it would upset me. So that's why I have not seen it. They're not as bad as everybody says they are. It's not as mean-spirited as a lot of people think based on the reputation it has. And it is honestly like a completely ridiculous soap opera. <laughs> They're so goofy. <laughs> They're so silly and goofy and twisty with flashbacks on flashbacks on flashbacks. And it'll show a scene from the last movie, but the camera will move over slightly and there'll be another character watching around the corner. <laughs> and you're like, oh, drama. <laughs> As that like main theme starts hitting. <laughs> yeah. The climax of every movie is like, we're going to show you a trailer of the movie that you just watched. Yeah. Here's the climax, but here's the twist. It's so silly and there's so much drama and there's characters with secrets and they don't want anyone to find out and it's so goofy. It's like a cartoon soap opera. Yeah. With like fairly well done like practical effects and gore and stuff like that. And for me, I find that stuff funny. There's a lot of behind the scenes stuff on YouTube that is like, so cool to see. Like, oh, yeah. Anybody who's listening who likes Saw, if you just look up behind the scenes, like, they have a whole behind the scenes on how they did the needle pit thing of like how they individually oh. took the needles out of the needles and put like a fiber optic cable. And then how they did all of the like attaching them to the actress who plays Amanda. Like, see, th this is not encouraging <laughs> me to watch this movie. Like, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, that is probably the most excruciating scene yeah. to watch in the entire franchise. <laughs> That's the only part that gets like a visceral reaction out of me when I watch that. Yeah. I find gore in horror movies to be fun, especially when it's done like practically. Yeah, a lot of people do. For yeah. sure. It's just fun movie magic. I don't know, but I totally get it when it's like not for someone. Yeah. I remember in seventh grade, sorry for all you Canadian listeners, grade seven. <laughs> Uh, we watched, I think it was called Danton about the French revolution, I believe starring Gerard Depardieu. And there's some scene, someone gets guillotined. And mm. so you see the guillotine go down and literally sever a head. And there's one of two times in my life that I almost passed out. I had oh. to walk out into the hallway and sit down. <laughs> it was one of those things where you feel all the blood drain from oh, your head. Yeah. You do that hard sit. It was so vi like viscerally upset. And this was not like hardcore horror movie gore. This was a historical drama <sighs> to be fair, but I can handle evil dead too. And all that stuff. Like if it's comedic, great. I love it yeah. on board. The moment it looks even vaguely realistic, it fucks me up and I can't deal with it. Yeah. Honestly, I think you could do the first Saw. I also think that, oh, that, yeah. that one is worth seeing for anybody who's like, I don't want to watch Saw, it's torture porn. The first Saw is a pretty fucking good movie. The rest are good for different reasons. Yeah. They're goofy. They're so fucking goofy. I cannot stress this enough. They're like ridiculous. Oh, the first movie is so tame. It is tame even by other horror movie standards. And it, okay. for some reason, got this really intense reputation immediately right out the gate. And I don't know why. It cuts away from almost everything. And the acting is completely ridiculous. <laughs> Carrie always being the biggest ham in the world is yeah. like my favorite. He is I a I did ham. a huge rewatch this year. There's a few parts in that movie where he looks like he's doing an impersonation of like Will Ferrell. <laughs> he's getting serious and mad and he's making his mouth look like this. And it looks like Will Ferrell being really dramatic on purpose as a comedic bit. You're so fucking right. It's so <laughs> funny. <laughs> it's so like weirdly color graded, but also like he's in that blue shirt yeah. that's so oversaturated. He's, he's walking around screaming. And when yeah. he has like all the pale makeup on. Yeah, yeah. Oh my and God. It has what I would call the worst car chase scene I've ever seen in a movie. When's the car chase? There's a part where, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on character names. Uh, the main cop guy who's, who's going main, after main Zep guy, right. through the whole movie. Commissioner Saw. <laughs> he, yeah, <laughs> Commissioner Saw. There's the episode title. He's chasing Zep in they're in vehicles. Like, it looks exactly like the cars are stationary in a garage and they're filming the front of the cars and they're driving like this dead on and th the background and the, the road is 
not visible. It is just solid black, and there's just a smoke machine blowing on the windshield of the vehicle. (laughs) All right, now I'm in. (laughs) The camera's shaking around, and it's showing both cars in the exact same shots. You never see the vehicles drive anywhere. It is (laughs) bizarre and frantic, and it is very funny. Yeah. I love it. Brian, I would love to watch the first Saw with okay, you. Okay, yes. It would be... Let's do it. ...so fun. <laughs> Every, all the other ones pass that. You would not hang with two or three. Saw 1's a great movie, but two and three are like, the bullshit gets cranked up by so much, but not like full 211 bullshit that like the way late in the most recent one, Jesus. Was Jigsaw the most recent one? Is that right? Uh, Spiral was the most recent one. <laughs> Spiral. With uh, Chris Rock. Right. <laughs> What the fuck was that movie? <laughs> Chris Rock, one of the greatest actors of our generation. Yeah. A very funny comic, but not a good actor. I think he was like one of the guys pushing to have that movie made. I'm a huge Chris Rock fan. I love him as a comic. I think he's really funny and smart. And every time I've seen him act in something, I'm just like, this is not your strength. Yeah, it's an odd movie. I will say I kind of like the new Jigsaw voice in the new one. That was like the only thing that I liked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The little Siri adjacent, I guess. Okay, well, I will watch the first Saw later. I'll watch it with you. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you, Kellen, for enabling this. Yes. All right. Now introduce your precious segment, Brian. First of all, it's not my segment. It's our segment. And I am saying our in the sense of all three of ours. Let's let's include Jarek uh, in this, of course. Oh, Jarek also, yeah. Uh, since Jarek is part of this as well. So I, I, I don't like to think of this show as mine because that is, I think, counterproductive. No, because to, it's not your show. As we discussed a couple of weeks ago, you know, there are a couple of names that are in the title. There are a couple of people who go into making it. You know, it's, it's, it's a group effort, which is why I think that this segment is so cool because you're so good at letting other people take the reins and really drive where this segment gets to go, how we introduce it. I think that it's really wonderful that that's something that over 112 episodes, it's an achievement, I think, at this point that you've managed to be so magnanimous about this segment, which is why I'm going to introduce it. The segment is called What's Poppin' and the theme song goes right here. Eat shit, Brian. (laughs) What's poppin'? What's poppin'? No, of course, I didn't want to interrupt you. Your voice is important to me, Layden, and I would never want to interrupt or stifle that in in any way, so. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Right, as we discussed, as you were interrupting me, yeah, last week. Now you said this this segment also now belongs to me. Can I have that in writing? Yes, (laughs) go off. All right, oh yeah, this is the pop culture recommendation segment. I should add that that would have been a useful thing to say in the introduction of the segment, but life is nothing but second chances, is it not? Kellen, what's poppin'? (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I have three things in mind. If I had to go by something that I've been watching recently, it's Our Flag Means Death. That is what I would highly recommend. It is amazing. It has Taika Waititi in it. It's a pirate show. Oh, okay. He is the star. Yep. yep. Oh, shit. It's not like documentary style, like what we do in the shadows, but it's like a lot of the same people clearly working on it, same kind of humor. It's all about Steed Bonnet, the gentleman pirate. He's like (laughs) born into wealth, who is bored and wants to be a pirate. And so he gets like a crew of pirates and they're in way over their heads. And he's just really sensitive and nice. And winds up bumping into Blackbeard, and it's really great. And Taika Waititi is Blackbeard, and it's amazing, and it's very gay. And it also has a non-binary character, and it's really wonderful. And I can't recommend it enough. It's fresh on my mind. I love it. What's it streaming on? It's HBO here. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I think if you're in Canada, you can get it on like Crave or something. Taika Watiti is just on this unbelievable role where I feel like kind of everything he does rules. Yeah, it's super great. What we do in the shadows. Oh, that's the best. The movie's great. The show is even better. I completely agree. Did the show finish? Is it done now? No, it's still going. They just finished season three, I think, is the most recent. I heard someone else talk about I think it was Harvey Guillen talk about 
what we do in the shadows as the queerest show on TV in the most like it's not a big deal way because all of the vampires are queer. It's just part of their lives. It's not a big deal. And that's just who they are. End of story. I love that. I love that. Yeah, that was the real tragedy of Twilight being huge of just like vampires are for the gays. So how it works. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love all the it's, characters. They're all very distinct. They're all very fun and very silly. I love the Jackie Daytona episode. Oh, and absolutely incredible. With Mark Hamill, of course, in it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Jackie Daytona, human bartender. It is. <laughs> oh. That is Matt Berry at prime Matt Berryness. So wait, what are your other recommendations? The other one was What We Do in the Shadows. And then my other recommendation... People who know me know that I really like dinosaurs a lot. And it's an anime movie about dinosaurs, and it's really cute. Aside from Jurassic Park, like the best dinosaur movie, hands down. It's an anime movie all about a T-Rex who gets raised by plant eaters, and then he goes off and raises a little plant eater son of his own. It goes in places you wouldn't expect. It sounds very straightforward, and it's super not. The dinosaurs are all really cute, but I would say... For artists, the backgrounds, you could like study the backgrounds. They're absolutely gorgeous. They're beautiful and colorful and lush. I have so many wallpapers of just like screenshots from that movie because it's just like beautiful and it's super heartwarming and cute. What's the name of it? You are Umaso. So um, you are, and then the name is U-M-A-S-O-U. Cool. I think that word means tasty. (laughs) Because when he meets his son for the first time, he's going to eat him. And he says, you are tasty. And then the little kid adopts (laughs) that as his name. Holy shit, this is so cute. Yeah, it's really cute. The dinosaurs look like really, really, really stylized and cartoony. It's contrasted with like all the other wildlife, like the animals and birds look like hyper realistic. It's really funny. And every time I've watched it in like a watch party with friends, it's gotten like a really good reaction out of everybody. So... Watch it with some friends. This looks great. Do you think this would be good for Audrey? Like for a seven-year-old? It has some like dino violence, if you know what I mean by dino <laughs> violence. Where like <laughs> dino stuff for kids will sometimes have scenes where a dinosaur is like eating another dinosaur. And it has uh, that. I think she can deal with that. Yeah. 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 Dino violence is like a quote. I mean, it's the episode title is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I was a very, very tiny child, I adored dinosaurs. In going through like childhood pictures, I sent one to Brian yesterday that's me in a box with like one of my T Rexes and another one that I'm wearing a huge Jurassic uh, Park t shirt. Oh, yeah. Watched Jurassic Park way too young, as well as other dino violence type media to the point that I was like, the dinosaurs are alive and they are coming to get me. Turns out I just had anxiety and dinosaurs were a convenient <sighs> way to. Oh, do that. Layton, what's popping? What's popping for me? This might be like my fourth popping in a row where I'm recommending a Stephen King book and I don't care. <laughs> so I've been blazing through Stephen King. I'm going to recommend a deeply underrated one. Needful Things. Oh my God. Immediately shot up to be in my top five. Really? It is very long and very slow because the first two acts are like, we're building all these pieces and here's this town and here's all this shit and it's really slow. And then the third act pops off so fucking hard, especially for a Stephen King book. The ending ending is kind of dumb because it's a Stephen King book, but like the whole third act is just like, everyone's dying, shit's blowing up, everything's popping off, everyone hates each other, everyone's trying to kill each other. Like, oh, hell yeah. It goes balls to the wall. It is like one of the most rewarding payoffs of all of that like slow, wait, who's this character? What are they doing? Oh, like really great. And there's a three hour director's cut of the movie adaptation on YouTube that I haven't finished yet because I've just been watching it piecemeal. It's Max von Sydow, right? As the yeah, main it guy. Is. As Gaunt. Is that the guy's name? Gaunt? Yeah, L- Leland Gaunt. And it's it's a shame that all I knew about Needful Things was the episode of Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty. where yep, they just named that same yes. character Mr. Needful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very fun. So that is one pop-in. And then my sort of half pop-in is that I've avoided It, the book, for a long time because I just fucking hate the new movie so, 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 so much. <laughs> Turns out the book is great. It's so good. I get it. I get it. It's great. I'm not done yet, but <sighs> Stephen King, it hits. 
That weird old fuck. Thank you, sir. He's good at what he does. Yeah. Nothing juices me up for like a good writing session than just like cramming Stephen King into my brain. <laughs> Stephen King's uh, famous Coke-induced nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, Brian. Yes. What's popping? Oh, I'm going to do something I believe unprecedented in the history of this show, which is I'm going to repop a thing that I recommended a few weeks ago as my what's popping, which is the Apple TV show Severance, which maybe is my favorite thing I've seen on TV in the last two or three years. It has gone Holy shit. from like, hey, this is pretty cool to this fucking rules. And it gives me all the best things I got from Twin Peaks in terms of bizarro mythology bullshit. Ooh. Okay. So it does not have the soapier stuff that Twin Peaks has, but it's a bit of a satire. It's more, more pointedly a satire of like workplace culture than Twin Peaks. It, it is like it's Twin Peaks meets office space, which it's just got everything I could possibly want in a show. It is so well shot and directed and acted. I can't get enough of it. The last episode of the season came out today, but I watched it at midnight last night. Like that's how hyped I was for it. It rules. So the whole season's out now? Whole season is now out. Again, if you want to see John Turturro and Christopher Walken romantically pine for each other, this is the show for you. It's funny. It's interesting. It's got a badass Patricia Arquette who gets to freak out a lot in a very threatening way. Oh, it, I, I love it. All right. Directed by Ben Stiller. Yeah. Like Whoa. most of them are directed by Ben Stiller. And guess what? Shit. He crushes it. It is one of the few things I've seen recently where I'm like, this feels totally original. Like I can't point to anything else like this on right now. And it's not bullshit. It doesn't waste your time. It flies by. The score is incredible. I forget who the composer is, but I love the score. I can't recommend it highly enough. So go watch it because I I just love it. Nice. Fuck yeah. That's what was popping. All right. Time for our final segment. Three part gratitude exercise. One part petty grousing. Theme song goes right here. Great. That was the theme song for Peaches and Lemons. It's time for Lemon, which is a thing that is a mild bummer, annoyance, etc. I'll go first because mine's short. Okay. My lemon is that it's fucking hot out and I have dandruff. They're, those two things aren't related, <laughs> but they add a level of like ambient stress of just like, oh, my fucking my scalp that it's hot and I'm sweaty and my scalp is itchy. And yeah, it's great. Fellow dandruff sufferers, what the fuck is up? How you deal with that? Let me know. <laughs> it's real fucking hot right now. Kellen, to put in terms you'll understand, it's 36 degrees. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, like, are we talking Fahrenheit or Celsius? Oh, no, that's Celsius. Celsius. Yeah, that's brutal. It's brutal. 97 degrees Fahrenheit. When you wake up in the morning and it's like morning temperature and it's already hot as balls, oh. and then you're like, oh my God, I'm going to have to like be conscious for hours one until the sun goes down. Like now I have to time everything in my day differently of something that I was going to walk to. It's like, well, I, that can't happen until the sun's down. <laughs> yeah, It's great. My dog always sleeps, but especially on a hot day, there's like a certain misery to a dog oh, yeah, to a, sprawled out. Like a hot sleeping uh, dog. Yeah. yeah. All right. One of you. I'll go. My lemon is uh, today was a day of child setbacks kid drama. There's a a skate park nearby that I took her to, which is normally overrun with teenagers. But since it's her spring break, it's not LA USD spring break. I was like, fuck it. We'll go in the morning and see if she can do this skate park. Well, 20 minutes in, she took her first hard skateboarding fall right on her side, immediately started bawling. I want to go home and she's totally fine. She was not hurt, but it was a hard morning for her. I took her to get a hot chocolate uh, and then she felt better. So we talked about it. You know, of course I gave the necessary parenting at the time, which was make sure she's fine. And then we talked about how with skateboarding, sometimes you fall, but you keep trying and then you get back up and maybe she did a thing she wasn't quite ready for, but we're going to keep at it. And it's a challenge to be overcome. And she had a good attitude about it. 
And then oh. today, because it's so hot out, we went to the community pool where if you want to jump off the diving board, you got to pass a swim test. And she tried it and she couldn't quite do it. Now, she's done this in the past, but it's been a while since she's been in the pool. And there were more tears over not being able to pass the swim test. No. And the diving board looks so fun. Wait, what's a swim test? They make you swim across the pool and back. But it's like a big pool if you want to use the deep end. And she couldn't quite do it. She got it one way across and then couldn't get back. Totally safe. Again, didn't get hurt, but. It was just disappointing because there's, you know, she's watching teenagers do flips off the diving board longingly and crying. And all she wanted to Ugh. was get in that diving board. But, you know, again, after comforting and parenting, it's a challenge for future Audrey that she will be able to do. And she's done in the past, just not today. So it was a lot of like crying. But the great part about kids is they are very open with their emotions, then immediately move the fuck on. Like when she had that hot chocolate in her hand, we'd never even been to a skate park. Like who the fuck knows what happened five minutes ago? You know, <laughs> we've just been drinking this hot chocolate forever. Yeah. Once we started playing tag in the pool, then the diving board didn't loom quite so large. It ended up being a positive, but it's a bummer to see your kid upset. Yeah, for sure. Kellen, let me. I guess minor gripe in Canada. The snow is starting to melt here. The snow melts and everything's super dusty. And my allergies were so bad today because I went out for a walk today before I came back and we got going. And I've been sniffling the entire time we've been doing this that my eyes were like red before oh no. <laughs> I jumped in call with you guys. And I was like, oh my God, my eyes are going to be all red on call. And l thankfully that cleared up, but I've been sniffling this whole time and I hate it. I did not notice that at all. I, no, if it makes you feel any better, I, I have like a terrible nose and am, have spent many of these recordings just like snotting in a corner. Folks at home, I guess, don't hear it unless... Brian edits an episode, which hey, uh, hey, 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 you do a great job. You do a great job. No, I'm just saying you're, you're that correct. you can hear me actually sniffle because Jarek is so thorough. And then it's jarring to me where I'm like, oh my God, I do it so much. I breathe like Michael Myers. Jarek is much better at editing than I am. I will freely admit that. I feel your pain. Is there like less sinus pressure now or you're, oh, you're yeah, good? I'm, I'm doing fine now. I mean, another way... Layton of saying what you said is that I bring your full personality, <laughs> the, the whole of Layton to light in a way that maybe Jarek tries to stifle part of you in a way that I never would. I'm okay with him stifling that part of me. I'm just saying. <gasps> All right, great. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be really funny if the editor just slightly, very subtly made every sniff just a little bit louder. <laughs> As it goes a, through the episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I That'd like be that. really funny. It's like you know? in the Hall of the Mountain King, like slowly getting louder. Yeah. That's very funny. Peach time. Layton, peach time. You share some peaches? Sure. Yeah. First peach, shout out to Chobani S'mores Flip Yogurt. That's like been my go-to breakfast. Don't even got to think about it. Those things are very, very good. They got little toffee bits. Sounds great. And low in sugar. Maybe. I don't know. They definitely, it's the kind of yogurt where it's like, should I be eating this for breakfast? It seems like it's not. Seems like not dessert. Good. Like a handful of chocolate chips. Yeah. But who cares? At least I'm eating breakfast. My second peach is that I went to a new bar that's really good and that I've been like hitting up semi recently with a decent happy hour. And the best part is that they do a whiskey sour that isn't just whiskey oh, nice. and sour mix. Like they do it right. Oh, do they do the egg whites? I don't think they do an egg white. They do like a little bit of bitters on top. I, I'm not nice. like an egg white purist with cocktails. Like I'll take it or leave it. But like folks at home, if you haven't had like a real lemon juice whiskey sour, it's so good. It's so refreshing. And I would just sit outside with my whiskey sour with a little bourbon cherry in it, reading my Stephen King book, thriving, mildly drunk in the middle of the day on a Monday, whatever. Like that's... I'm grooving. Yeah, who hasn't been there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Something about a Monday midday drink when things are slow or waiting for something is just like, all right, cool. Uh -huh. Anyway, third peach, I went to a VHS shop that did a screening of a bunch of old Gumby cartoons. Oh, wow. Oh, that's awesome. Which, A, cool to be in a VHS shop. Stop motion ones? Yes. There were ones from the 50s, the 70s, and the 80s. I thought it was going to be like 
three Gumby shorts and we watched Gumby for two hours, which God bless. It was really cool, but I did not know it was going to be two hours. Like I had a really great time. The people running it were like so enthusiastic about Gumby. But after a while I was like, how is there more of this? How, how is there more of this? This this makes me feel like I'm being so negative on the event because it was the coolest thing ever, but it was past my bedtime. Who knew there was that much Gumby content? Who knew there was that much Gumby, right? Because my exposure to Gumby was the very formative Mystery Science Theater 3000 robot rump short, which is one of my favorites. See, for me, it was Eddie Murphy on SNL as Gumby. Really? Yeah. I mean, he's in a straight up Gumby costume. It was like one of his classic early SNL bits. Yeah, folks, if you haven't seen the Mystery Science Theater 3000 Gumby short I'm talking about, it's on YouTube, and it still, to this day, kills me to the point that, like, there are multiple quotes from that just live in my lexicon. Like, uh, well, that squares my breasts. Like, I think that (laughs) a lot just throughout my day. It's great. Those are my peaches. I'm happy to go next. Peach number one. We showed Audrey some old animation that she, like, fucking loved recently Popeye like the original Popeye cartoons like the from like the 20s oh, yeah. or 30s or whatever, like the Max Fleischer era type stuff and she could not get enough like the old black and white stuff and it's cool to watch but you know I assumed she'd be like eh, whatever old cartoons but what does she think when she sees that stuff this is just like Cuphead and this kid oh. loves Cuphead so she was very excited about old Popeye cartoons, and it was really cute to watch. That's, That's adorable. Great. You should show her more Flesher stuff from that era. They showed a couple of that era in between the Gumby things, and the whole time I was sitting there like, what if I just loudly said this to just like Cuphead? <laughs> <laughs> and just piss it's, off everyone in the room yeah. and be asked to leave. They ripped this off from Cuphead. <laughs> Yeah, I really, I really should because I that stuff is so bizarre. We showed her the spooky, scary skeletons one, you know, around Halloween. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's some really wild stuff in there. Peach number two is we just got back. It's still Audrey's spring break, but we did a trip up to the Pacific Northwest and went to Portland and Seattle with the family. Saw a bunch of friends. Stayed with some friends in Portland. Got to experience Seattle. I had taken Audrey there for a little dad-daughter trip a few years back. And this is our first time back there. And she absolutely loved it. And it was just a really fun family trip. And I love both of those cities very much. We also saw the Children's Theater in Seattle, which has an amazing kids' theater. And saw the musical version of Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus, which was a big hit. Do you guys know what those books are? No. Not okay, they're, no. they're kids' books by Mo Willems, and it's about an irascible young pigeon who wants to drive a bus, among other things. Is it sort of like in the if you give a mouse a cookie vein? Not quite. It's not like A leads to B leads to C leads to D. It's more like this pigeon is a young child and wants things that he shouldn't be doing. It's like make sure the pigeon takes a bath, things like that. They're very cute. I like them a lot. A pigeon driving a bus. I've never heard anything so ridiculous. Someone better stop him. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. And uh, final peach is we are now locked into a date for the new Go Banana Go album, which comes out on May 6th. That's my kids band. Oh, my God. You know, as we talked about, Kellen animated a video for last time. This time we only have one video for it, animated by Shucharu. Ah, (gasps) love that guy. Friend of all of ours and also a very talented animator. And it's for a song starring Audrey. Yo. Oh, my God. Uh, Have I showed you this one? You better send me this shit. Did I not send this to you, Layden? I didn't even know that you had another (laughs) Go Banana Go album coming. I feel like a terrible co-host and friend. Uh, Shit. I'm going to let that lie. The album comes out on May 6th, and um, you're you're neither. To be clear, you are neither a terrible co-host nor a terrible friend. I am terrible at promoting the shit that I do. So don't blame yourself is the point. Apology accepted. It's not an apology. I want to be very clear about this. I did not not say sorry. Yeah, but I accepted it as an apology. Anyway, but but not apologizing. I just what I heard was an apology. I'm not apologizing here. I just said that I value you. As both a co-host and a friend, but I'm to be clear. Oh, I was not apologizing. So anyway, that album comes out May 6th and I'm very excited about it because it's got some really stupid fucking songs on it. 
and I think people are going to like it. And there's significant Audrey presence, Rachel presence, Jim yes. Roach's kids yes. are on it. It's fun. So those are my peaches. Congrats, Thanks. buddy. Thank you. Kellen. Kellen, peaches? Okay. So another dino thing. I love talking about dinos. A trailer came out for a thing called Prehistoric Planet. It's got like David Attenborough and oh, uh, yeah. John Favreau. I think it might be a bunch of the people who did like Say What You Will About It, like the Lion King remake or that like live action. But it's like that kind of tech for like the special effects. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a dinosaur documentary and it just looks like gorgeous and amazing Ooh. and charming. They don't make enough of those. They had like the walking with dinosaurs thing yeah, I like, remember back that. in like oh the late God. 90s and that was a really big deal. But like they've had a few more, but I think the last like big one was like 2008 and they all kind of look like PS2 cutscene graphics at this point. <laughs> um, so it's yeah. all hands on deck, big, huge names and like documentaries, really, really nice effects and dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. And they look great. And it comes out next month. So I'm really excited. <gasps> May 23rd. Yeah. My second peach is I want to shout out my favorite pub in Montreal, which is called Brewtopia. It's on Rue Crescent downtown, just off of St. Catharines. I want to say one of the reasons why I came here, <laughs> it's a brew <laughs> pub, but it's so delicious. They have a really great raspberry beer that they make in-house. And I went there recently with my friends, Kyle and Aaron Schmidt. Aaron Schmidt is a big artist and animator who's been really popping off lately. And I want to shout out the Aaron Schmidt on Twitter as well. Great artist. Yeah, we just had a lovely time at Brewtopia. Every time someone comes to town or I want to get together with friends, I go there and it's really great. And you should check it out. It's got good vibes. Cool. My third peach. So me and my friends have been watching a show that's old at this point, but it has been a nice bonding experience. We watched through all of a cartoon called Craig of the Creek. It is a very, very cute animated series that is on its fourth season. I think it's like right in the middle of it. It's just yeah. about a bunch of kids. All of the show takes place like after school and they live by a creek and all the little kids have different friend groups and they're all very eccentric I love the family. I love Craig's family. It's just super, super fun, good vibes. And me and my friends have just been watching a ton of it and loving it. Beautiful. That was Peaches and Lemons. And that brings us to the part of the show where we ask you to plug stuff. Where can people find you places? Is there anything in particular you'd like to promote? Yeah, sure. My Twitter, where I post art, mostly just for like my commissions and posters and stuff like that is at BallBots. That's the name of a webcomic I'm working on right now, but I don't have much content to share on that regard. But you can check out my art there. I just had an animation come out on Wrath Club on YouTube. Lyle Wrath, he's a good friend of mine. He commissioned an animation from me. It's very funny. Audrey can't watch that one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just so you know. I figured, yeah. I also would like to plug my D&D podcast that I do with some friends. Top Spin the Fuzzy is the DM. We have Nick Terhorst oh, nice. in it as well. We have Adam Three Times and Dana Doodles. Oh, wow. Oh, my yeah, God. Nice. Yeah, it's a bunch of artists and animators. We call our group the Killustrators. <laughs> <laughs> and y'all have been doing this for like a while, right? Yeah, like four years. Like 2018, oh summer my God. of 2018, we've been doing it. And the show itself is called Stumble Quest. And uh, you can find it on basically every platform that podcasts can be found on. We got it on YouTube. We have it on iTunes, on Libsyn, if you care about that. Oh, of course, yes. Hey, Libsyn. Yeah, let's start a Libsyn chat. Libsyn, 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 Libsyn. So yeah, we're approaching our 100th episode. Each episode is nice. around an hour long, so it's tons of content. But don't worry about uh, if that sounds intimidating. Oh, believe me, if anyone <laughs> listens to this podcast an hour long, they're like, that's short, huh? Yeah. An hour long is not <laughs> intimidating to people here, for sure. Yeah, just if you want to listen to a bunch of animators play D&D, &D, it's very fun, lighthearted time. Our character dynamic has a lot of feelings going on. Like the characters like to work out their feelings and stuff like that. If you're into D&D &D campaigns like that, which I think a lot of like the art community kind of leans towards when they play D&D. &D. Awesome. Well, Kellen, thank you for being here. It's so great to see you and to talk to you. And I just appreciate you taking the time. And it's, it's great to hang out. 
Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's always nice. Cool. Well, I guess we've been mildly trying out different things to end this show because I got sick of saying our sort of stupid catchphrase that I brought upon myself. So now I'm just going to put the onus on you. How would you like to end this episode of Late Night with Brian Wecht? Bye! Late Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Night, or email us at LeightonNight at gmail.com. That's all she no. wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. perfect. <laughs> that's that's great. <laughs> Easy, economical, <laughs> elegant. <laughs> I don't. We will never top that. That was incredible. Yeah. You also you max mm. the gain out on that. It's so overblown. It's so no. It's perfect. <laughs> it's so just bye.